All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for coming here for this uh, session on Ayurveda and technology. Um, we are going to have a very lively session here. It's a packed session, so please, uh, you know, uh, uh, request all your attention over here. Uh, we will try to have some Q and A at the end of the session. If we are not able to do that uh, because of the uh, panel that is very packed here, we will provide you with an email ID where you can send your questions, and uh, we are. Uh, hoping to have uh, some kind of a virtual forum, uh, you know, in a few days from now. Uh, so the goal is to have a community uh, that that can kind of keep interacting with each other, not just in this session, but you know, hopefully, you know, months and years to come together, right? So that more to come on that. Um, I would be, uh, I would like to invite Radhika ji from Art of Living. Uh, Radhika Prabhu, uh, she has been associated with Art of Living for more than 35 years, and she has been supporting people of all ages uh, from different methodologies and interventions that Art of Living offers. I'm assuming, you know, she will talk a little bit more about that, and then we will get into a short video from Nishaji, who is also from Art of Living. So, Radhika ji. Steal this microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really wonderful to be here. You can clap. I think this is an honorable thing to be clapping for Ayurveda and technology. Um, I want to start today's conversation with maybe a little bit of a dismal statistic, and then I promise I will go into more optimistic material, if you'll in indulge me. You know, today, one in four Americans were called what's the, what we call now the sandwich generation. So it's people who are caring for infirmed elderly parents while also raising children of our own. And why is this of particular concern to economists, policymakers, families around the country? Because at the same time we reach our retirement age, that savings which we didn't generate in our own personal retirement is slated to hit a fiscal cliff, right? It's a subject of a lot of political debates right now, the ending of Social Security as we know it, right? And it poses for us as people who are interested in healthcare this question of how do we make healthcare more responsive more cost effective, and tilt it towards prevention, right? So this is one major theme which we're going to get into in today's conversation. Now on the other hand, I promised more optimistic material. We know that the emergence of complementary and alternative medicine, I feel badly that I'm putting my back to this esteemed group of panelists, but I talk and walk, um, so I had to get out from behind the podium. We know that complementary and alternative medicine in the next nine years will become an $800 billion industry. So it poses another big question for people in adherence to Ayurveda. Where does Ayurveda fit in to this burgeoning industry? How do we make it part of the conversation? And I wanted to, you know, we'll hear from this expert panel, we have academics and people in industry, those that have really been pushing the needle on Ayurveda from a variety of different angles. I'm not that expert. My entree into Ayurveda came 35 years ago because of my mother, uh, Ramola Prabhu. She's a physician. She went to Hopkins, um, OBGYN and pathologist, um, and really wanted to explore healthcare from a different, more expansive viewpoint. She started to study under um, Dr. Deepak Chopra. At that time, he was just starting his movement towards quantum healing. And two years later, she happened to meet Gurudev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, and really began, he tasked her to start studying Ayurveda under uh, Trigunaji, who many of you might know is a very well-respected Ayurveda, or was a very well-respected Ayurvedic Vaidya in India. And then he tasked her to establish Art of Living's first Art of, um, Ayurvedic treatment center outside of Montreal, Canada. So how, this great life transformation for my mom really translated for me and my siblings into spending our summers in Canada from a very early age, and then gradually into a more intensive focused study of meditation, breathwork, and of course, Ayurveda. And that really didn't become important, I would say, for my own day-to-day -day life until 2015, when these, this mother, this great figure that I had, those same words that she could use to melt anyone's heart, if anyone knew my mom, you could say that that was true, her words started to fail. She started to, um, experience what Western medicine called early onset dementia. And Mother's Day of 2015, she was unable to speak. And I turned to Dr. Lokesh Rathuri, who is a very well-respected Ayurvedic doctor who's running um, quite a bit of 
Ayurveda for Art of Living Foundation. And he asked us to come to Boone, North Carolina, where Art of Living has a state-of-the-art Ayurvedic facility. And he did treatments for her for 10 days. And at the end of those 10 days, the same person that wasn't able to speak came out totally 100% restored. So for me, it was that moment where I saw the clinical application of Ayurveda for what Western medicine would really neurologists kind of put in a bucket of early onset dementia, and there's a certain path that you go down. I saw it turn a hopeful corner, and it, it stayed hopeful until 2020 when, as we know what happened, COVID and the world locked down. And at that time, all of the Ayurvedic facilities went along with it. And the panchakarma, this treatment modality that she was using, we could no longer access. By June of 2023, she was no longer able to walk. She was no longer able to speak. She was no longer, she was immobile. And Dr. Lokesh visited in September of this year. And he came to our home and he met with her for two hours and he did a treatment. I don't know what he did. Again, I'm not an Ayurvedic doctor. I work in government. This is far afield for me. But in those two hours, two days later, she was able to hold her grandson She's sitting up. She was able to say, this is my grandson. And for me, it was, again, the shocking moment of revelation that we have this body of knowledge that is life transforming. Disease does not just affect a mass of cells or a discrete body part. If I can say one thing at the end of this four year journey with my mom, it's that it touches every single aspect of a person's life and the people in their circle, their loved ones, their families, their colleagues. Ayurveda is the science of life. It's not just something that treats a discrete set of cells. It looks at the family. It looks far beyond in these original texts. It's amazing how expansive Ayurveda is. And I'm really honored and it's a blessing for me to be able to be here today to introduce such a wonderful, amazing group of people um, and champions of this science here in the United States. They, you know, stand on the backs of giants that have come before them, so many doctors and people that have been pushing in the, it for, hidden for years, pushing this science. Um, the first person I wanted to just draw our attention to is Dr. Nisha Manikanthan. She is the founding director of Sri Sri Ayurveda and herself um, really focused of late, um, both clinically and in her research on cancer care and diabetes, and she'll just kind of level set for us what the principles are of Ayurveda for those of us that might be expert, it might be some repeat information for those of us who are coming in more from a technological background, um, it might be new. So over to Dr. Nisha. Namaste. Esteemed guests and respected fellow seekers of well-being, today I'm here before you in the crossroads of ancient wisdom and the technological frontier in the pursuit of a harmonious and effective healthcare system. Our journey takes us into the heart of Ayurveda where the profound meets the progressive. Ayurveda's global relevance lies in its holistic approach to health and emphasis on personalized care, natural remedies and preventive measures which is making it increasingly sought after as a supportive medicine system worldwide. Today, we can explore the transformative synergy of Ayurveda and artificial intelligence, a partnership that holds uh, the promise of personalized health and holistic well-being. Let's talk about telemedicine. Integrating Ayurvedic practices into the platform of uh, telemedicine emerges as a bridge across geographical barriers. That means Anyone, regardless of their location, can benefit from Ayurveda's personalized consultations and holistic healthcare guidance. And when we talk about Nadi Pariksha, integrating AI algorithms into Nadi Pariksha, the pulse diagnosis, signifies a convergence of uh, advanced technology and uh, traditional diagnostic experts, expertise. And this can potentially provide more detailed insights and streamlined analysis, revolutionizing the holistic diagnostic approach of Ayurveda. And regarding the smart diagnosis and monitoring, AI algorithms can create comprehensive patient profiles, weaving together Ayurvedic parameters, lifestyle influences, 
and even genomic information, AI can identify patterns in the patient data. So this tailored approach harmonizes the Ayurveda's focus on individualized care, ultimately increasing the treatment effectiveness. And AI-driven insights with electronic health records enhances the accessibility and coordination of Ayurvedic healthcare. And even in the if you find the even in the fine-tuning of treatment through AI-driven analysis is uh, practiced. Imagine an intelligent system that adapts Ayurvedic treatment plans based on real-time patient responses. This is not just efficiency; it's a dynamic approach to decision making for Ayurvedic practitioners. So these models, AI-based diagnostic models are already expanding in the areas of decision making and uh, symptom classification uh, based on varied uh, clinical data and the generation of pharmacological data bases that can be utilized in Ayurvedic pharmacology. And as we explore deeper, we encounter the fascinating realm of Prakriti prediction models powered by AI. Imagine an AI system which can predict your prakriti, your unique constitution. This is not just prediction. It is a gateway to personalized care. By tailoring the Ayurvedic recommendations based on our prakriti, we move beyond generic approaches to wellness. Now, let's talk about the influence of AI in the realm of lifestyle adjustment. Instead of offering rigid prescriptions, it generates insights personalized for you. They are user-friendly suggestions that align with Ayurvedic principles. And it encourages sustainable changes in our daily life for long-term wellness. For example, AI might recommend uh, specific dietary practices or uh, uh, yogic interventions or walking schedules based on your unique health profile. And um, wearable technology. See, AI effortlessly syncs with data from wearables, providing real-time health monitoring. This is not just data, it's empowerment. There is an active partnership between technology and individual well-being. The synergy between technology and Ayurveda extends beyond diagnostics and treatment plans. It can revive ancient formulations, like preserve and uh, revive the ancient Ayurvedic formulations, which are made more viable through innovative techniques like advanced research and development methods like uh, nanotechnology enhance the bioavailability of herbal compounds ensuring the potency in modern therapeutic applications forms lives so this journey towards this goal is not just an aspiration it is a commitment to a healthier and more harmonious world thank you namaste Thanks so much to Dr. Nisha. I'd like to welcome onto the stage now Dr. Anand Priyadarshi, who is a IITB graduate and was paid, I'm told, um, as a PhD postdoctoral researcher at Carnegie Mellon to look into whether the unit consciousness is indeed a big computer. Um, so he will guide the conversation today on the nexus between Ayurveda and technology. So welcome, Anand. I'm here to learn as you are. Um, basically, these panelists are coming from very different fields, and they have very unique approach to this entire landscape. And uh, yeah, it, it, it is basically the universe is computer, not the con consciousness cannot be computer, of course. So uh, we will go one by one and ask a couple of questions and, and learn from them their experience in this field. Uh, starting from Bhushan Deodhar, it's uh, very hard to really tell his bio in a small way because there are so many hats he wears. Um, he had been on the technology and Ayurveda both side. Uh, on the technology side, he led uh, for 12 years as a CEO in Sumer Solutions. And uh, he is a member director, uh, member board of that. And he also is a CEO for Shankara Skin Care, which is all natural uh, skin care product. And uh, he is current CEO for 15 years and he is taking it to all good places to that. So my first question to him is that while do you see, you also oversaw an app, right, wellness app, which is, has 100,000 subscription. Do you see a way to integrate that AI ML and see how the, uh, this, this can go further? 
Thanks, Anand, for the warm welcome and introduction. Nice to be here, everybody. Um, so we actually have uh, been working with a company to, as Dr. Nisha was uh, sharing in her uh, in her uh, speech, that we can actually create some AI-based uh, models using the information or the knowledge of Ayurveda. And that's precisely what we're doing, is where we're integrating the, the, based on the symptoms, we're creating an engine based on AI, which, can, which people can use based on the symptoms that they're experiencing. And this, uh, this AI tool will ask a series of questions to them and match that with the, with the knowledge of Ayurveda. So we are integrating that together today, and we plan to also integrate into our journey wellness app that we have developed, which is currently focused more on breathwork meditation, but we want to also integrate uh, the wealth of Ayurveda into that same system. Wow. Nice. And on the Ayurveda side, also you are running uh, Shankara, and uh, it it has gone to you know all the places, top spas, and you are also getting trust from the directly from the client. In this journey, I mean, this is Ayurvedic product, right? So in this journey, what is your learning, if you can share with our audience? So the company that, uh, that I, I run, Shankara Skincare, we actually, it's, it's a marriage of East and West. So the way we actually conceptualized it was to use the knowledge of Ayurveda in the world of skincare and wellness and integrate that with the Western anti-aging science, natural science, so using the uh, science of actives, antioxidants, and how we can merge this uh, two together. And what my biggest learning in this whole journey over the last uh, two decades is that uh, we need to figure out a way to integrate this knowledge of Ayurveda with the modern technology, not just uh, the technology in terms of uh, artificial intelligence and so on and so forth, but also the modern science. And if we can have enough research done on the benefits of Ayurveda, which can be clinically proven, then that would encourage the doctors, the physicians in this world to really tap into this, this wisdom, which, we, which they can integrate into their diagnosis and, uh, and, and, and patient care. And that is where I see a biggest advantage. Because instead of just bringing Ayurvedic physicians who are just expert in Ayurveda, I think that would be limiting. But if it can be used in a complementary manner, where we are not negating anything, I, I think there is wisdom in all parts of the world. And today the, the, the goal I find is that we need to integrate all this together. Instead of just saying, okay, this is the right thing and everything else is wrong, if we can merge everything together and use the wisdom of all parts of the world together for better care of human beings. I think that is the biggest learning for me. Thank you, Bhushan. Now we'll move to uh, Vatsav Raman. Dr. Vatsav Raman is a IT alumnus um, from Madras, <laughs> IT Madras actually. And he is also business, business lab development lead at Thermo Fisher Scientific Boston. And you oversaw basically lots of conventional drug going through the FDA trials. And also I understand you you have experience in taking Ayurvedic medicine through the same route. So what's your learning in that? What kind of things which were similar or different? Yeah. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so this marriage of science and ancient wisdom that you know, Bhushan just talked about, it's already happening, right? And uh, I want to uh, tell you two stories about drug development in Ayurveda. Um, one was NOC-19, which was launched by Sri Sri Tattva, and they approached me and they said, can you help me bring this to market in the US? And NOC-19 is a polyherbal Ayurvedic formulation, and this was developed during the time of COVID. Uh, it had really strong antiviral properties, according to Ayurveda, but is there science to prove it, right? So the team in India actually did a lot of scientific research. They ran a clinical trial of 100 patients, uh, mild and moderate COVID patients. They, they were testing RT-PCR negative in five to seven days. No symptoms were left behind. Um, then they you know, took it to animal models of COVID. They looked at the lung pathology of these hamsters that were infected with COVID, SARS-CoV-2, completely cured, right? The lungs were looking really healthy in, 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 a, in a decent amount of time. And then they brought it to me, and then we, we established this collaboration with Stanford 
um, to look into the molecular basis of this polyherbal formulation. And we found that in the uh, cell model for COVID, SARS-CoV-2, it completely inhibited viral replication and um, really is truly an antiviral, right? And so it has all the properties to, as a drug, to be offered as a drug in, in the US market. Of course, you have to go through the rigor of clinical trials and everything. Uh, but then we ran into some challenges there. Of course, we needed to raise the capital to bring it as an authentic drug here, right? It's millions of dollars to do that. And then the second piece, it is a polyherbal. Right now, the FDA does not have a strong route for a polyherbal uh, uh, formulation, right? So there we were running into a hurdle. And then the second story I want to say is before NOC 19, I was involved with a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur, and he actually traveled the world looking for traditional medicine that could help disease, current disease. He traveled with a bot botanist, and uh, he traveled a lot of tropical countries and found graviola, the fruit graviola in India, it's called Sita Pulp. And it's used in many different countries to, in traditional medicine to treat tumor and cancer, right? And he saw it with his own eyes, how effective it was. So the botanist obviously took that and tried to isolate the compound that was anti-carcinogenic. He actually was able to find it, um, but it turned out to be toxic on its own. It can only be taken as a fruit, which is interesting, right? And so uh, my friend, he did clinical trials as well. 20 breast cancer patients with double-blinded placebo control, 19 of them completely cured, just on the fruit. And then 70 prostate cancer patients with another control, all of them cured from the fruit, right? And again, so really, right? So this is not just in India. The same fruit is used in South America, West Africa, Southeast Asia, Myanmar, right? So it's, it just shows there's so much wisdom that in the traditions that can be validated by science. You know, you can take the rigor of clinical trials and science and molecular studies and find out more about this. So we need more interest uh, and money funneling into this direction because we could find a lot of solutions uh, for current infectious disease, current uh, cancer, you know, the, the problems that are, you know, really uh, right now uh, we are facing from a clinical standpoint. So, yeah. Wow, that's very, very wonderful insight. One thing I also noticed that there are wisdom around the world and we can have that uh, things going forward with that. However, there's another side of the problem, right? And uh, when we move to, say, Whole Food, there is an aisle of herbals, medicine, and everybody is just left on their own wisdom to choose. How do you think that the wisdom from Ayurveda can stand out? Sure, so there is a pathway actually through the FDA to launch botanical herbs, and if it is a single herb, treating a specific condition, you can still put it through the rigor of clinical trials and launch it, right? So we need to attract investment. We need to marry science, research, uh, investors who are interested in bringing this to the market, and the ancient Ayurvedic practitioners, right? And then when we bring this trio together and they're uh, pulling it to, you know, through the clinical, the rigor of clinical trials, you can actually launch it. And if you don't want to do that and you just want to go to market early and if it's a polyherbal, um, yeah, definitely we can do that. And what is the beauty of Ayurveda is that it is personalized, right? And right now there is a pivot in medicine also to go into personalized medicine. There have been tremendous uh, amount of work done in genomics and other areas where everything is personalized to you, right? And that is what they're finding is most effective in treating disease. So Ayurveda is already doing that. And it is not only treating disease, it is also improving your health as you sit right now, whether you're diseased or not, right? And that is where it stands out from other supplements, like multivitamins, for example, right? So it is personalized to you, where you are in your path. And that is where the marketing around Ayurveda you know, should really change to make it more personalized. So if a person comes to you, you know, using the AI tools that, you know, uh, Bhushan is developing as well as Dr. Nisha was talking about, you can get a diagnosis of, okay, you got to take these herbs on a day-to-day -day basis. You got to change your life a little bit here and there. And this will really make an impact on public health, right? Instead of waiting for your disease to manifest and then going to a hospital, you know, the amount of dollars you can save the government by just taking care of public health through Ayurveda is going to be tremendous, right? So that's my take on that, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vassav. And as Director of Art of Living Scientific Research, I wish you really very best to take it forward to the, to the population. Uh, let's, yeah. 
Let's move to our third panelist, Sab Kanajia. He's IIT Kanpur alumnus, founder and CEO of Mindwell uh, Labs in New York. And he is also a senior advisor of Government of India on digital innovation and focused on digital transformation in health and wellness industry using proven mind science and technology and AI to uniquely personalize it. And I have seen his demonstration about AQ app. It is just wonderful. I, I was wondering if uh, it, it tracks the individual state of mind. How, how do you do that? I mean, do you use something similar to say Amazon like like feature or something different, or give me some functionality of how, how do you do, uh, especially when you say recommend Ayurvedic diet with that type. Sure, thank you, Anand. Really good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, it's a topic uh, very close to me, both on a personal and uh, professional level. Um, so Mindwell Labs, which is uh, uh, a deep tech startup uh, you're talking about, um, you know, uh, the technology we have built essentially is to really personalize interventions at an individual level um, using variable and AI technology. So what is really happening in healthcare, the big, one of the biggest transformation which is happening is through this variable technology, you know. This is not a smartwatch. This is a doctor on your wrist. So imagine a doctor, go and talk to any physician and say, okay, instead of seeing your patient once a year, if you can get summary data on a daily, weekly, uh, monthly basis, they will all love it, right? So that's what we have done. So we said, okay, everything starts here. Uh, nine out of 10 times when you go to your physician, stress and anxiety is causing the problem, right? So it's okay, let's measure this. I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've been involved in digital media and entertainment for 20 years, and I moved to healthcare because I felt that all the tools we build to disrupt that industry can be applied into healthcare. And one of the first things you know, um, I wanted to do was to bring data into decision making. And I realized that the most important part of our body, human brain, we don't track. You take your typical car, there are sensors all over the body of the car, information coming to the dashboard. But with a human body, we don't track that. But with these things, we can. There are two billion variables out there. Wow. They're becoming commoditized. Xiaomi, a Chinese company, sells one for $15, one five. So we all will have one of these things, either on a wrist or a finger. These are two form factors which are working. So is it okay if you can measure your biometrics in real time throughout the day, and if everything starts here, let's build a personalized um, PCP in the cloud for everyone who can track you throughout the day, use AI to look at your patterns and trends, and then make recommendations throughout the day. Because we know that these things change human behavior. You know, how we hail a taxi, how we order a grocery. We have changed that in the last 10 years. We all have this, right? And talking about access, a lot of people in the world do not have access to a doctor. So if we can give agency to each individual on a 24-7 basis to passively monitor them with a clinical clinically validated technology, and then give them recommendation and nudges throughout the day, then that can be huge in building the future of preventive medicine. We've talked about prevention here, right? Uh, unfortunately, our system is not based on prevention. Why are we talking about Ayurveda in 2024? It's a 5,000 year old science. Because what we have tried in the West is not working. We talked about how um, you know, in the U.S., the healthcare is almost 20% of our GDP. At the rate it's growing, it can bankrupt the U.S. economy, right? So prevention is, you know, I think the future in many ways. Uh, Dr. Leroy Hood is the father of biotech revolution. The U.S. says we should spend more on prevention and wellness than on healthcare, which is sick care. So we have built a mental wellness PCP in the cloud. We just launched an AI coach. And it's advising you not just your mental fitness, but also on physical fitness, diet, uh, sleep, and your relationships. And we are, built, we are fine tuning these bots. So it's basically a chat GPT on steroid. You can download the app, it's called Peak. It's your AI coach for peak performance. It's only on iPhone. It pulls the vitals from a variable device throughout the day and gives you very personalized recommendation. And instead of making people experts in Ayurveda, we said, okay, why don't we just create Dhanavantri? 
It's a bot in the under the hood. Okay, it'll ask you a bunch of questions and assess your constitution. And based on that, depending on where you are, whether you are in Northeast, the cold weather, or you're in Arizona and the warm weather, it will actually tell you what kind of diet you should have, what kind of recommendations you, know, you should have so that you can be a more balanced person. Thank you, wow, this is very empowering to have your phone as your personal coach and so much in, in time uh, feedback. How do you get the trust of people, I mean, to trust with you? They're very intimate data, but they're very helpful for them. So can you say something? Sure, um, consumer trust is one of the most important things for us. I mean, I spent 20 years in digital media entertainment building a bunch of technology which um, takes your data and then sells you stuff, right? So. Um, Digital media, I was involved in buying advertising.com or 20 years back when I was at AOL. And, um, uh, you know, we took your data and sent you personalized content, which was an ad. And when I moved from media entertainment to healthcare, I said, we have to implement the same technology in probably the most important industry in of all. And um, uh, when I met my co founder, Dr. Sean, who's a neuroscientist, he said, Sab, I can measure this, I can quantify this based on autonomic nervous system, vagal tone, because he had been working in these personalized wellness clinics where they put leads here and measure your vagal tone and autonomic nervous system, which is a secret healthcare in, in our body. The moment he said, I can measure and quantify this, I said, that's the business we want to build. You can give me this number, I can send them personalized content and build a consumer business. I've been doing it for a long time, that content was an ad based on your data. Here, it can be Dhanwantri giving you Ayurvedic advice based on your data. So we knew that we have to, the, the trust, because as you said, it's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a data which is very important and very personalized. We said we will never share or sell your data. Advertising will not be the business model. So it's a subscription-based app, you pay us, five, ten dollars a month, whatever the price point you'll pick, and we'll give you the recommendation. Um, so if you just convince the user that, you know, we, if you download our app, you'll see a couple of screens. We don't do anything with your data. We never sell it. We adopted very, uh, you know, rigid GDPR policy, even though it's not required. We are in the wellness space. We are not prescribing any medication, but voluntarily, even for a startup, we said we'll adopt the most stringent privacy, you know, um, uh, formulations to make sure that people are very convinced that their data is not going anywhere. Right. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, this must be very insightful for some entrepreneurs who are looking to go into this area. And speaking of data, we, will, we should move to Dr. Praveen Paritosh, a strategic research uh, advisor, ML Commons, former senior scientist, AI ML at Google. Praveen was one of the inventors of Knowledge Graph, uh, which was acquired by Google in 2010. He was an early leader of Google AI and now leads AI safety and efforts at ML Commons. <laughs> so Praveen, uh, yesterday we were talking about a little bit uh, on this. The modern medicine is facing a variability crisis, right? And Ayurveda always treated variability as a feature rather than a bug. <laughs> uh, but then uh, as many of us either think or know that we know Ayurveda just by reading one paragraph <laughs> or, or on the other hand, People are, you know, uh, think that it is not, has, doesn't have the scientific rigor which it should. So how do you think AI or AML particularly can help Ayurveda? Thanks, Anand. Um, thank you all. This is uh, great to be in this panel. Um, I am the newest uh, one in terms of the knowledge of Ayurveda. I've been studying AI and evaluating AI um, because one thing interesting about AI is people make lots of big claims, there's a lot of hype. It's hard to tell the distinction between reality and, and so I got to watch that from front row. What was interesting, around 2015, there were some breakthroughs in computer vision. So people could actually detect objects. So if you show, showed a picture of a person throwing a frisbee in a park, then it could produce a caption that a person throwing a frisbee in a park. And that was like revelation. And at that point, the founders of the field, Jeff Hinton, Jan LeCun, and Yeshua Bengio, so this is the trinity that started this AI revolution. They won the Turing Award that year. 
they made claim, Jeff Hinton made a claim, that you know, with this success of computer vision, what radiologists have been doing, it's all going to be automated. We are able to going to detect, you know, basically they're looking for features, little blips, little tumors, and we have enough data from previous healthcare records. We're going to train models and they'll be, and I think he even put a date like 2020 or something like that. And it didn't happen. And then there was uh, a publication from Google that was in Nature uh, that was on diabetic retinopathy uh, with scans of the eye. And they showed really good results. And they had to, six months later, retract the paper because when it was deployed in the field, it didn't quite work. And so what was happening there was that AI was treating these problems, like in the simplest format, AI is trying to solve a problem that is this email spam or this not spam? So as long as you can assume that there is some kind of ground truth on these things, you can train a model to do that. But turns out that when you show a scan to three radiologists, you get diversity of opinions. So there isn't a clear ground truth on this stuff. And so when AI was trying to model this, and not just AI, like science in general, when you talk about clinical trials, what we're looking at a clinical trial is that the mean population has done better between the treatment group and the control group. And we don't have any way of looking at what is the variance of this distribution. So when we're talking about most scientific results in AI, that is lost. And now, what's, that's the bad news. The bad news is that our fundamental scientific apparatus is not suitable entirely for looking at something that has so much variability. The good news, and so, so does AI, the good news is that we've been doing a lot of work in other places that are not science, that are about personalization. You talked about ads. And think about, you talked about Amazon, Netflix recommendations. So these things are entirely personal. These are not like supposed to be population level aggregate statistics. And, and then there has been like, you know, there was this guy, Benjamin Bloom, in 1968, he wrote a paper called uh, The Two Sigma Problem. It shows that if going, a bunch of people going through different methods of instruction, if they went and had one-on-one -on -one instruction, they were likely to be two standard deviations better than any other method of instruction. Now, we know this truth, the education community knows this truth, but we can't afford it. We have a teacher for 40 students, if you're lucky. We can't have a teacher for every student. And so, I think that something about personalization has been coming up in this panel a few times, and it seems like, you know, if we take the clinical approach, if we take the scientific approach, all we will be doing is population level aggregate statistics. Now, if this philosophy, if this methodology has more variability and is more personal, then that stuff needs to be radically transformed. In the meanwhile, we have tools of personalization and the way AI can learn things that can solve the problem, but that is extra, that is going outside the realms of the methodologies that are accepted. Well, the, you, two similar thing which you just mentioned was also in the Sal uh, Khan presentation, and I think AI is going to leapfrog this effort. Uh, there's not much time left, but I would like to come back to what Radhika was sharing about her personal journey, about her mom. And so how do you see if, I, I understand that you have a, a startup in the direction. How are you going to help that population who post-retirement go to de increased decline of cognitive and social isolation. Yeah. That, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, Radhika, you brought up this as well. Uh, I think that the area that is like the biggest problem uh, in the world right now is the el elderly and the aging population. And in the US, one out of three of American population is going to end up with dementia of some kind. And the 85 plus population is going to double in the next 10 years. And we simply don't have care. We, in the healthcare system, in the professional and family uh, members who are burdened with caregiving. So there is, seems to be that that is a place where we can apply some of these technologies, some of these ideas that have already come up in the panel to do something better and perhaps all of Ayurvedic you know, ideas can go there. Thank you, Dr. Paritosh. We among us have an honored guest, <laughs> uh, Dr. Vaswati Bhattacharya. Uh, if you could come and give us some remark for the panel. Thank you very much. So I'm a medical doctor. I'm an MD uh, trained in the US. 
And I've been practicing medicine. I'm on the staff and medical faculty at Cornell Medical College in Manhattan in the Department of Medicine. So I've been practicing modern medical, uh, what should we say, evidence-based medicine. But for those of us who are also scientists, I also did PhD work in pharmacology and neuroscience. And recently, with a Fulbright, I was in India at IIT BHU from 2013 to 18, working on basmas. How many of you know what basmas are? OK, so that's really great. Uh, if this was a room full of non-Indian Americans, the hands wouldn't be up this high. So I look at the scientific basis of basmas, and I'm listening to each of these wonderful panelists and the stories that uh, we're all sharing. But we're in a room full of engineers. and so. With my background in pharmacology, neuroscience, public health, modern medicine, and now Ayurveda, I keep asking, how do we help people heal? And for the engineers in the room, there should be a few things that come up. Data. Where are the data? Because I hear people say, come on, Ayurveda. If there's one thing I know about Indians, Indians in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, they hate Ayurvedic people. Why? Because you're taught that in school. You're taught that it's all quackery. Yeah, see, you just said it. It's quackery. Why are we taught it's quackery? Because that's the vogue. All of my cousins who are MBBS are taught it's vogue. So here you have people that are talking about data. They are IIT graduates. They're talking about operations and processes. And they're talking about real questions of health. right? Whether it's a story of someone who has a patient in their family or whether it's the uh, real statistics of what's happening right. in our country. We have data that we need to put into a process, and we have people that are coming up with ideas. So for those of you in the room who are interested in Ayurveda, I would really invite you to find our wonderful speakers and ask real questions so you challenge us. I have uh, been working on several projects with Basmas, but also with artificial intelligence. And I'm just going to leave you with a couple of things, because I have read, I don't know how many in, people here have read the fact, Shastras. Can, we, can I suggest something? Yes, sir. It's really getting, we are getting warmed up. <laughs> so if we can reconvene and have a question and session, whatever question you have, we have real experts here. We can come back on those questions. Right now, we have to go for the other session. So we have to. Claude, I'm sorry. I have Can I just finish yes. in 30 seconds? Yes. So I will um, ask you guys to read a little bit of the Shastras. Open up any chapter of the Charaka Samhita. You can go to charakasamhitaonline.com. It's available to everyone. It's a group of 108 of us who are Ayurvedic physicians who have translated the Sanskrit as best as we could into English. And read any chapter and just see how the doctors in the ancient times took a disease, but they took a patient and said patients come in these different ways, and how they actually took that disease and helped to solve it. And this is what we need to put into the science of modern medicine. So there's something called the Dashavida Pariksha, 10 ways of diagnosing, and the Ashtavida Pariksha. Dashavida, I'm just telling you the shloka. Deshyam dusham balam kalam anala prakriti vaya sattva satmya ahara. If you understand any of those words, those are the 10 factors that every single person will vary by three to four categories. Take it times 10. And if you can figure out where the person is in each of those categories, you can personalize. That's the recipe for personalization. No one's using it. It's there. The other one is Ashtavida Pariksha. Look at eight factors on the person's body, their tongue, their eyes, their pulse, their urine, their uh, feces, uh, their facial expression. And you can figure out what's going on inside of them without having to look at any uh, other markers. So as a medical doctor, because I'm licensed, I take people's uh, nadi, and I can tell them right now what's going on in their body without taking blood tests and scans and then waiting five days for the results and then bringing them back. And I can diagnose them right here and prescribe a medicine that is usually herbal because it's more bioactive and taking that forward. That's what Ayurvedic Vedyas are doing. I compare that to what I'm doing as a modern medical doctor and it doesn't compare. And it's much more expensive to do it as a modern doctor. So people that come to me do not come to me for modern medicine. They come to me for Ayurveda. But the people that are coming are the ones that don't say quackery. <laughs> you have to believe that there's a potential that it works. And what these guys are all doing is analyzing 
normalizing it and reducing the intuitive part into what is real, which is disease can become health if you look at the person and not at the disease. Yeah, it's a really blessing to have people like Vasuti Bhattacharya who are trained not only in Ayurveda but also from you know conventional medicine. And actually, we uh, we would love to have this kind of discussion going forward, and you know, bring out new discussions. Uh, we do not have, unfortunately, time for question answer session now, but we can actually come back after the other session. And meanwhile, please take a seat, and I would like to invite Amita and Ranjan to honor you with the gifts. <laughs>